right people. Any weekend plans? Liam, when you you're when are you going to um the East Coast or whatever? Liam, I'm just like I feel like I'm talking to myself whenever um we start the all like all lecture long. Um Liam, aren't don't you have they have a trip, right? I, I can't remember when it is. I think he's frozen. Oh, okay. No, I'm Liam, you're excused for not re uh, responding. For making me feel very lonely in my in my chatting. Hey, Celeste. I'm finishing up my cucumber and then we'll get started. Is Lexi here? Lexi, are you ready for your um for your thesis defense? If Lexi's there. This is this is what happened last time is I, I pulled it up and and Celeste, you were on the screen and you were like the big picture on the screen for the entire time. Let me swap the view. I do not see Lexi. Maybe Lexi is um is preparing. This is just sounds super annoying, me chewing a cucumber in your ears. All right, let me pull up the slides. We're going to talk about alcohol again. We have one more day of alcohol after this one. And we'll do that on Monday when you're hungover. And we'll talk about hangovers on Monday. That's what we're going to talk about. Monday is the physiology and therapy, the interventions and the causes and interventions of hangovers and and some you know old, we'll call them old husband's tales, old frat tales of, of how you cure them and then what the actual science says. But today it's mostly metabolism. We're going to do some mTOR for those who uh if you've had 147 or 248 you know all the mTOR stuff you will ever need to know in life but i'm going to talk about it a little bit today to to talk about where alcohol plays in with mTOR signaling mTOR being the foundation of of metabolism so today is a metabolic day and then um start so i'm pulling up the slides so i'm mumbling to myself I assume everybody can see. So uh, today is mostly a metabolic day. We'll cover a few points that we talked about on Wednesday, and then we'll leave a few points for Monday, and then we'll have alcohol all wrapped up, and we'll move into, I think we'll, we'll do a quick run through altitude, uh, both high and low. And then I want to get into the sleep deprivation, insomnia, sleep deprivation, uh, circadian disturbances, because that applies to you probably more than alcohol does. I'm sure alcohol applies to the bulk of you or has once applied to everybody. Uh, it may apply this weekend, may have applied over spring break, you know, from time to time as a coping mechanism, whatever it is. To, to make the party go on louder and longer and your role in it to be more vibrant and whatever, you know, alcohol serves a lot of purposes and those purposes have, have found themselves in your life probably. And, and so there's a relevance here. Uh, there might not be as much of a relevance to your life of, you know, subterranean exploration and, and, you know, what the physiology is there. But it's fascinating because you all have bodies, you know, every one of you uh, has a body and that body can, can travel to a range of destinations and it will respond differently based on which destination it finds itself in. But, uh, I think sleep deprivation and and it's whether it's insomnia or it's all nighters on occasion for a test or it maybe there's sleep anxiety where people are like ah oh, I just I have a test or I have a tournament tomorrow it's tennis or something I have a tournament tomorrow and 
and I just got to get my sleep. And we, we'll talk about that stuff of how much sleep you really need for the, for the next day's performance and, and what it's going to look like acutely, what it's going to look like chronically. But I think that will be a part of your life, probably more than alcohol, but just a few uh, reminders of what we talked about on Wednesday. We've been tinkering with alcohol. We've been getting wasted and everything from there's a nice history of rum uh it, that book a uh, history of the world in six glasses the narrative of rum is fascinating because it's it was designed it was it was it was sort of created to get poor people drunk it was all right you know bums need booze too and that's what rum was for so the idea of expensive uh rum is is sort of uh in the u.s it's almost anti-patriotic um, and we all know the Boston Tea Party, but that was the third tariff, right? And and the first one was was on the the molasses. It's a, it's a fat read it at some point if you care about alcohol history or something like that. But um, the tariffs on on rum, there was a sort of prohibition from getting it from France, but they France apparently had good sort of molasses and and let's make the cheapest possible booze ever and give the booze to the soldiers and stuff. Um, so if if there's a such thing as you know, a, a bottle of liquor that you put like, you know, stars and stripes on or something like that. I mean, we have a bunch of international students. Don't think of me saying like I'm like a, like a super patriot or something. But uh, my my what I think is the most patriotic American drink is not like Bud Light or Coors or or whatever. It's like rum, um, and so I always find it weird when there's like expensive versions of rum because it just sort of defeats the whole purpose of what it was there for from the beginning. If you want expensive something, gin is really nice. You know, there there, there are nice drinks where where you ra like ramp the cost up a little bit and and it gets better. With rum, you're supposed to feel sick after drinking it. Um, but but so you know, ten thousand years ago, eleven thousand years ago, we're, we're seeing all these fragments of pots, and so historically, I mean, people were were drinking alcohol and making the most of the of the booze. For, yeah, even um, I mean, brandy used to be. I mean, look at like you know Thomas Hicks and 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 the marathon run, and and people used to use alcohols and ergogenic aid before we had any really good ergogenic aids before we'd synthesize testosterone and and had all of these really effective um you know ergogenic aids with alcohol was a totally fine one to use but it's made through fermentation right so if you think glycolysis just as you learned it in biology not as you learn it in x phys where you begin where you skip hexokinase uh because remember you only have you're a human being you only have four or five grams of sugar in your entire bloodstream the the vampire there's no vampire with a sweet tooth well diabetes aside whatever if um if they're going for like the diabetic patient or something but but vampires that's not a sweet tooth right you don't have much sugar in your blood but you have a ton of of glycogen and if you start let's say you go into a met value you remember those things a metabolic equivalent of the task if you go into a met value of 10 that's 10 times your resting metabolism you're burning through calories pretty quickly tenfold uh, the rate of lion there and if you do that and you're using sugar and you only have like four and a half grams of the stuff in your in your bloodstream and your central nervous system needs it. I mean, like your brain needs the sugar and, and you ramp up your metabolism tenfold. We have a problem. Right. And so what you do is you use glycogen. Uh, and so you'll use glycogen phosphorylase is the enzyme and then phosphoglucomutase to convert it into G6P, glucose 6-phosphate right here. So hexokinase, this is like, you know, you're sleeping and your nervous system is doing this stuff or your yeast, right? This is how yeast works. Yeast isn't doing what you do of, of glycogen phosphorylase to get G1P, glucose 1-phosphate, and then phosphoglucomutase to get G6P. So a human being and a little yeast, these are different, but, but we do our glycolysis at the end. At the end, um, yeast, right? Where it's, this is fermentation. We're going to convert this into ethanol. Now, if you're a person, right, let's convert this into, I don't know, acetyl-CoA. Let's convert it into uh, lactate. Like, yeah, there's a couple of fates that you can do with your pyruvate. Uh, but with, if you're in yeast, all right, let's get, let's get us some booze. Let's get a good buzz going. And uh, the alcohol dehydrogenase in a person, 
This is different um, from what is doing in, in yeast. For alcohol dehydrogenase, what is going to metabolize your alcohol, convert it into acetaldehyde. Um, this in yeast, this is where you're actually getting your ethanol from. So the, the enzyme that in you is converting your uh, the ethanol that yeast gives you into acetaldehyde so you can dispose of it. Uh, this is the enzyme that, that creates the ethanol uh, in the yeast. And who knows the, you know, the reason you know, from evolutionary perspective, from a, from a you know, chemistry perspective, from a celebratory perspective, whatever, who cares, who knows? I don't know, it's fascinating, but who knows that with the reason uh, that yeast has this fascinating reaction that, that, that we get alcohol this way. Uh, I mean, it seems believable that it's just like, you know, dissipating or it's the, it is the you know tobacco sulforaphane caffeine kind of kind of effect or it's just like this will evaporate super quickly ethanol that's going to evaporate really fast oh asexual reproduction these little fungi but remember alcohol carbon compound very few carbons right very few carbons it's not it's not um fat it's not even carb like a, a, a carbohydrate right it's, this is there are very few carbons here and methanol, we're going to talk about on Monday, we're going to talk about methanol and the metabolism of methanol as opposed to ethanol. And what happens if you wind up with methanol toxicity? What do you do with that? And what happens in a hangover? So, so those things will we'll get sort of potpourri topics on Monday. And if you have alcohol questions, I don't know, maybe I'll have answers to them, but we, we can chat. You should you know, pour yourself a drink while we're talking or nurse your hangover while we're talking. That hydroxyl group, that's just no H, right? That that hydroxyl group. Um, acetic acid, remember vinegar. Let's 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 dispose of our alcohol. Uh, cholesterol, a steroid alcohol. Um, right there, the hydroxyl group. Cholesterol, a steroid alcohol. Uh, distillation. Remember the, the manufacturing of alcohol. This is is a, a, if we're going to boil something, you're going to apply heat to something, you're going to add energy to that thing. And the more energetic it is, the more likely it is to, to depart um, its great exodus from its mother fluid, right? It can, it can, it can um, depart that fluid and, and the ethanol is, is what's, that's the more volatile one. It's, it's going to depart first. Well, methanol will really depart first, but you apply heat Right, and it's not a hundred percent alcohol in here, right? And so you're getting the the ethanol um, out of that. You're sort of evaporating it out of that. But the azeotrope or the azeotropic limit, remember, is ninety five and a half ish uh, percent alcohol. And an azeotrope, what that is, remember, is the vapor and the fluid the vapor is coming from have the same composition. You're not you know, condensing anything. You're not isolating anything. You're not extracting anything. It's just the same stuff that's coming up in the vapor as as is in the in the fluid below. Uh, and so, you know, if you're if the alcohol percentage is above that on the bottle, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. But uh, ethanol, that's really that's that's what you want to drink. That's what you want to put in your mouth. That's what you want to swallow. The hundred percent ethanol, right? That's that's gonna or something close to that. The azeotrope, right? That's that's gonna do some harm. Um, but you don't want to drink methanol. We'll talk about that on Monday. So you pour it in your glass and you swallow it. Okay, it goes down into your stomach. And if you don't have any food in your stomach, if if all that's there is fluid, remember when we were talking about the hydration stuff. And the more sugar that you have in the drink, the gastric emptying is slower of fluid. The gastric emptying of sugar is elevated. So if you wanted to get more sugar into circulation faster, eat more sugar, really get more sugar in that drink, and you will absorb more sugar. But the rate of gastric emptying of fluid slows down as you put in um, more sugar, or as you put in whatever content, you know, it's, it's you're going to slow down uh, gastric emptying. So without food, uh, alcohol is going to enter the the small intestine pretty rapidly, and there's a passive diffusion into circulation. 
and you know once in circulation we talked about this it's going to cross the blood brain barrier and and there seems to be a lot of gabergic you know gaba gamma aminobutyric acid um activity uh there seems to be some augmentation exacerbation excitation of the hpa axis let's get some adrenal activity going on so there's there's some stuff once it once it once it crosses the blood brain barrier which it can very easily do but water is going to depart uh, your stomach, right? Gastric emptying water is going to depart faster than alcohol, uh, faster than you know a fluid with ethanol in it. You know, the higher the ethanol percentage, you know, you, we're looking at some possible uh, changes as well. But um, this is a reasonable study, this one. Just let's look at some different percentages of ethanol. So 4, 10, or 40%. Um, so you remember the idea of the proof stuff. Uh, it depends on, on you know, which continent, uh, whatever you're on, of, of what the what a proof means. But, but the percentage of, of alcohol here. Um, now, alcohol... <sighs> It's going, it, it, there, there are two effects it's going to have for, for slowing the rate of gastric emptying. One is if you drink alcohol, the other foods you eat will leave your stomach more slowly. So this same study, here's drinking water and the, the gastric, it's like the um, half-life, sort of the half-emptying time. Here's with water. And here's with 4% alcohol, five and a half, you know, beer, there's, you know, 11.4, 10%. But you, you add some alcohol and, in a high caloric meal, whatever, and, you, and you see the gastric emptying rate, it takes, it takes more time. It takes more minutes so over here, oh, what, 125 or so, whatever, over here, 160 or so. It takes longer to empty food from your stomach if you introduce alcohol with that food. And you see the similar effect with a low caloric meal. So whether you're eating, you're sitting down at the dinner table and having a feast, or you're at the bar and you're munching on, you know, what are the pretzels and the peanuts and, and you know, man, there's a lot of bacteria in those things and, and that's going to mess you up too. That's going to give you more illness than the alcohol will. Um, but it, it doesn't matter what you're eating. All of it's going to come out a little bit more slowly if that water has some ethanol in it. The other uh, side of that coin is, is true as well, where um, the alcohol itself empties from your stomach more slowly in the presence of food. So if you just take your shots. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people, when they go to young, young folks, when they go to the parties, <laughs> when those young people go to the parties, um, there's, there's like a shot goes in right away or two shots go in right away. And then there's a nursing of the drink. And, and sometimes people just drink too quickly. Um, they're afraid that they're not going to have enough in their system or or um, I don't know that the, the party's going to run out of alcohol and they better get it in their blood before someone else does. I, I don't know what the, the, the motivation is there, but, but the buzz you get off of alcohol is a, it's, it's a finicky sort of spiritual place that, that magic zone. Um, there's some data, some evidence that says if your blood alcohol content is on the rise and you're in that space, then it's more of its quote upper uh, characteristics. If you have the same blood alcohol content, but it's on the decline, it's dwindling, it's going down, you haven't had a drink in a while, now you're experiencing more of that quote downer effects. I mean, so, so there, there's a lot of, I'm not gonna call it pseudoscience, but scientific commentary that maybe isn't perfectly supported, but but it's interesting stuff. But the, the idea of, of <clears throat> eating food with your alcohol it is if you if you have a low caloric meal it just spikes and then you start metabolizing it um at, at an elevated rate you're, you're eliminating it at an elevated rate as opposed to um flattening that curve a little bit <clears throat> if you have a high calorie meal now you remember alcohol dehydrogenase this is the enzyme we'll talk about this on monday from the perspective of well what happens if you have methanol as opposed to ethanol but if you have ethanol you're going to convert it into acetaldehyde that that alcohol dehydrogenase dehydrogening your alcohol you, your ethanol you convert it into acetaldehyde 
um, your liver, your stomach uh, lives in both of those uh, areas, right? Stripping the hydrogens from the alcohol uh, molecule and Carrie Fisher, right? The uh, Princess Leia, for those who've seen Star Wars or whatever, or read her obituary or something. Um, uh, it, it, alcoholism, we're going to talk about a little bit more today, but it, it involves more than just uh, alcohol dehydrogenase. You're going to get some other enzymes joining the cause. I don't know what a good analogy is here, but like if you, I don't, if just if the workload gets to be too much, ah, you got to hire some temp staff. Let's say it's like the holiday season. It's the holiday season and you're Macy's but it's like not COVID and stuff. It's, it's a holiday season in like 1999 or something. And everyone is going out shopping because the internet is hardly a thing. The internet is just pictures of people's cats and dogs in the nineties. Uh, and, and so like Macy's, like everyone's going shopping there and they hire all of these temporary staff workers to deal with uh, the large. So being an alcoholic or, or, or subjecting yourself to excesses you're going to have some other systems that are going to contribute, but the main system is going to be alcohol dehydrogenase and then acetaldehyde uh, dehydrogenase to get the um, acetate to get vinegar, uh, basically. And once you get that vinegar, you've completed your, your uh, metabolic quest and you've disposed of this and it's time to have another drink, right? Um, now, men tend to, this is early in life, early in life, all, everyone in this class, uh, the, the guys by way of genetics uh, are going to have more, are very likely to have more alcohol dehydrogenase in their stomachs. Um, but also, guys tend to be at a little bit lower risk. There's evidence of a lower risk in, in guys for cirrhosis, right? For you know, liver problems, cardiomyopathy, so your heart issues, um, and peripheral uh, neuropathy or nerve issues. Some of the common complications, it's not like everybody who, you know, drinks on the weekends casually is going to wind up with a complication. That's not how alcohol works, but, but excesses of indulgence for very long durations. Guys tend to have a, a degree of protection uh, more than women, at least early in life, um, we're, we're seeing that. <clears throat> but a lot of the ethanol that you drink you start to metabolize it before it actually, you know, obviously metabolize all of it, but, but somebody who can really handle their liquor is probably just metabolizing more of that alcohol before it actually gets into systemic circulation, you know, before, before it's going to cross the blood brain barrier and, and give you your symptoms, give you the, the kind of magic space and slurred speech and, and weird gait and uninhibited decisions and great yoga class. Before any of that, you're going to start metabolizing uh, some of that ethanol, and um, you know in the in the stomach, right? The alcohol dehydrogenase in the stomach. And this is a look at men and women across the lifespan. So you know you get into 20 years, 30 years of age, something like that, 40 years of age. And guys, we're going to have more alcohol dehydrogenase in in the stomach. This is this is gastric alcohol dehydrogenase. And as, as guys get into, you know, 50, 60, whatever, there's a deterioration in this. Women don't really seem to see that. Now, this is one study. Don't take this as this sort of you know, carved in stone, like, you know, oh, this is the, you know, Moses came down with this tablet too, you know, just like walking down Sinai with his the alcohol tablet. Now, this is how it works. This is just a study, right? But but it, it's characteristic of what you see in the literature is something like this, where women don't seem to, to have the same uh, uh, reduction as guys do in alcohol dehydrogenase. So on Wednesday, when I said later in life, uh, guys get more gal-like in their alcohol dehydrogenase. Men become more feminine in their, in their alcohol and their ethanol metabolism. This is what I was talking about. Um, this little graph illustrates it pretty well. Um, alcoholics, this is just guys, 
right here, which is what the, this is the reason you see under age 50 alcohol dehydrogenase activity over age 50 man that gets that goes down over age 50 alcohol dehydrogenase activity goes down so you can't handle your liquor as much uh, while well, I used to drink five, five glasses of you know let's just call them bottles five bottles of wine and now i'm down to two glasses and then I, you know, i'm hung over in the morning P people don't handle their liquor as well when they're older and alcoholics or or you know again i don't care what you call uh, alcoholics seems accusatory and it's in the vernacular itself seems like you it sounds like talking in the second person you are you know where you just start accusing people um but that's you know if if you have a uh, a career of of ethanol metabolism um your alcohol dehydrogenase activity really tanks not that many subjects right so this isn't reflective of the whole world population this is a study again just a study now earlier on wednesday i talked about uh yeah, asian glow or asian flush it's often called um because it's it's about I have seen numbers reported. I, I can't tell you the exact percentage worldwide, but I have seen numbers reported that are like 8% of the world population, 8% of, you know, upright bipedal humanoids um, uh, have uh, the flush response when they're drinking, but it's very high in East Asians, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, uh, we're seeing a, a, a much higher, you know, more than a third, um, approximately, I know these, these reports, but let's just call it a third of, of East Asians get the flush response, you know, Asian flush or Asian glow. Um, I, I think it's maybe it's time to update the vernacular and, and just call it, you know, uh, I, I don't know, like, acetaldehyde insufficient it's some sort of like nomenclature that that is not you know isolating populations maybe that's that's where we are in in, in titles but but this is sort of the classic naming and there's the alcohol um or the the uh, acetaldehyde uh dehydrogenase or aldehyde dehydrogenase acetaldehyde or aldehyde dehydrogenase um and so it, all you get is a different there's a different allele, you know, a, a, a gene variant, a version of a gene codes for a protein, right? We have these protein coding genes. And so, you know, there's like an insulin gene and there's a titan gene and there's a myosin and a actin and a just name a protein. You got a gene, right? It's going to code for that thing. But if you swap out some of these amino acids, right, we've got these 20 amino acids, these are the ingredients in a protein. And if you've taken genetics, you know, you have like the codons, there's, all right, put in this amino acid, now put in that 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 amino acid, stop codon, you're done, get out of here. And in the assembly of these proteins, they're going to fold according to the sequence of amino acids. But if you put in the wrong amino acid, if you know a single nucleotide polymorphism, if you put in just the wrong, you know, um, uh, glutamate should be there, and you throw in a lysine instead, you're going to get a functional difference, and that's what you see uh, with this um, aldehyde or acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, where this is normally what it's supposed to be with the glutamate in there. Alcohol, alcohol dehydrogenase. You get your acetaldehyde. Right, and then use that dehydrogenase in your acetate. Okay, done, fine. What well, we have metabolized our alcohol in the way that most people do, call it 92% of the world population, ballpark figure, in the way that most people do. But if you have that variant, if you if you have that gene form with the lysine where the glutamate's supposed to be, alcohol to acetaldehyde, perfect, happens just fine, exactly on pace, no holdups, no hitches, no problems, perfect. Okay, now we have our acetaldehyde. Well, we have this terrible version of, of acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So what do we do? And there's other stuff that can that can kind of pick up the 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 charge, but but it's difficult to convert it into acetate. Now you'll see stuff like this, um, risk factor for esophageal cancer, things like that. There, you, there's plenty of articles that that are. Um, it's just epidemiology, right? So 
I, I say just epidemiology and like I teach it and those are the stats I run and stuff, but, but I'm honest about what epidemiology means. It means big picture. What is epidemiology? Well, it's like the, um, nurses health study and things like this where you just do big population surveillance and you don't really control for anything in a randomized way and 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 you try to control for stuff in a regression analysis but but yeah most epidemiological findings turn out to be wrong in the end uh, for these big population surveillance you don't tinker with anything you don't um uh it's not about mechanism stuff like that so that's that's what this stuff is going to be a lot of uh, epidemiological uh surveillance so if over the weekend you drank and just your cheeks look like rudolph you know the red whatever cheeked you know drinker uh don't worry it's not like you're gonna like oh my throat's gonna be filled with tumors and and i mean there's there's ones on alzheimer's stuff like that but don't it doesn't really I, it doesn't really apply to you. I mean, that's not really how epidemiology works. So this is not, when I put up these articles that say, oh, beware of an association between X and Y, um, it, do you have this version of aldehyde or acetaldehyde dehydrogenase? Well, then you're at a higher, that's not really how it works exactly. Um, so that this isn't what I'm talking about, like the, the cancer. I'm just saying the metabolism of alcohol. That's how the metabolism of alcohol works. Oh, let me pull up the chat that hasn't been up. Connection dropped out. Um, it looks like Liam isn't, isn't with us anymore. Uh, I see a gray name. Uh, so will you stay full longer if you have alcohol after eating? Good question, uh, Nick. So will you stay full longer if you have alcohol after eating? Um, so especially if you eat a bunch of fat, you know, you, with, with the more fat you eat, you seem to get even slower gastric emptying. But probably uh, if you have, there's a number of... <clears throat> a number of mechanisms for appetite. You know, hormonal mechanisms for appetite, neuronal mechanisms for appetite. And according to the stomach distension, you know, are you going to, if, if you're maintaining uh, food, if gastric emptying is slower, all right, you're going to delay the release of ghrelin. That would be one thing. And, and so there's going to be mechanisms to say, yes, you'll stay full longer. Does that mean you will stay full longer? I'm not sure. Um, I could, I could outline mechanisms that would, that would indicate or hint at, yes, you will stay full longer. But what, you know, there's those studies about, uh, they, they took x-rays of people's backs and sent them to a bunch of physicians and say, what would you do with this person? And it was in the 90s, I was in 97, 94, maybe 1994, somewhere around there. And uh, maybe Journal of American Medical Association, something like that. It's, it's been 10 years since I saw this study. But they, they, they send these you know, x-rays to these um, physicians and say, orthopedists and say, what would you do you know, with this, with this person. And they're like, oh, all of them are like, oh, I would definitely operate on this person. You know, I, I, you know, put some artificial disc or do a fusion or do whatever. And what they didn't tell the physicians was nobody felt the tiniest bit of pain and nobody had any back complications, no functional issues. There was nothing wrong with the people, but they're just, here's an image of people. And a lot of people have a presentation, you know? And so sometimes it, it, mechanisms are one thing and reality is another. So it's a really good question. If you you know take a shot with something, uh, have some have some wine or something with it, are you going to stay full for a long, longer? But there's a mechanism to that says yes, but I don't know if that plays out in, in real life. Um, so the adaptations, right? There's a specificity of adaptation. You drink, you adapt um, until you hit overtraining, right? So if this is tennis yeah you get better and better at tennis stuff you know you hire gil rays as your trainer you're andre agassi and you, you do a bunch of of i don't know shuttle runs or some jumps and stuff and and you get better and better and better and better and better until you do it too much too much too much too much and then you get worse it's the same thing with alcohol uh 
you're going to adapt, 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 adapt. And then you, if you, if you subject yourself to too much stress, you get the equivalent, the sort of a liver, the, the hepatic equivalent of, of uh, overuse injuries. So uh, the breakdown, the clearance, right? The metabolic stuff, that's really what we talk about. Uh, enzymatic clearance of, of ethanol. Uh, the functional or pharmacodynamic is, is the cell's response. Um, but again, if you are Carrie Fisher, your, your, your uh, Princess Leia, your, or any other uh, person with a history of, of excess alcohol ingestion, early on, you're going to have this ability to clear alcohol better and better and better. You're going to call in some other alcohol metabolizing systems in addition to uh, more kind of upregulation of the alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes in your stomach and in your liver. But if you go too, if too long, too heavy, right, you're going to wind up with cirrhosis and, and the tolerance goes way down at this point. Once you have liver damage, your tolerance goes way down. I used to work at a drug clinic in Hartford, uh, Connecticut, and we would do drug testing on all these people. And it was an exercise intervention for alcohol and drug abuse. And people who had, you know, court appointed, I mean, there's, there's like a live-in, you know, court appointed substance uh, abuse facility and, and sort of this, this big rehab facility. And uh, if people have a messed up liver, that's, that's going to show up for a long time, right? Now, if people have a functioning liver, they're going to metabolize this pretty quickly and, and you're not going to get a blood alcohol content or whatever, you know, drug we're, we're looking for. But as soon as that liver is a mess, that your, your system isn't going to process this stuff very effectively. Now, it doesn't end with a liver. It's like, well, my liver is problematic, but I have isolated it. I have quarantined all complication to my liver. That's not really how it works. As soon as uh, one organ goes, it starts to uh, make a splash and, and you know, uh, it, it, it takes the other organs down with it. Um, so uh, your brain being one of them the hepatic liver encephalopathy. Um, so brain, right? The liver brain pathy. And this is just, what, what you wind up with is an inability to clear ammonia and manganese and, and it gets into the brain and you wind up with some complications that way. So this is a possibility, stuff like this. It's not like anything that anyone, nobody in this class is gonna get it, but but understanding what some of the possible complications of excesses of exposure are, excesses of alcohol stress, what that, what road that sends someone down in. And I've seen um, serious uh, substance use complications working in a drug rehab facility. And I also met murderers, people who murdered their drug dealers. Um, one person, well, two people actually, um, one of them murdered the drug dealer, one person, uh, like lit a train station on fire um, with people in it. And I don't know what that was about. I don't think the drug dealer was inside, but, um, but that's like, that's weird. Uh, but also you see biological deficits. Now getting into the larger picture of metabolism, you put alcohol in your mouth, you'd swallow it, whatever you swish it around in your mouth and instead of spitting it out and, and, you know, trying the next glass of wine, or maybe it's mouthwash or something. Um, you just get it all in, and now you've metabolized it. Hopefully, your acetaldehyde dehydrogenase has, has metabolized it appropriately, and and you just you got a little bit of vinegar. Wonderful. Other components of metabolism are affected too. It's not just, I have metabolized my alcohol, I am done. That's the end of the picture. Alcohol affects nothing except for my thoughts get funny, my voice gets loud, my posture gets, I don't know, can, if a posture can get loopy, that happens too. But mTOR, mammalian or mechanistic target of rapamycin. Uh, so over here, we have mTOR complex one because there's a raptor regulatory associated protein of TOR target of rapamycin. Um, uh, Richter, rapamycin insensitive companion of TOR, right? So you know, when, when we do muscle fizz, 140, 147 and 248, I, I really go into mTOR. But 
alcohol and mTOR have an interesting relationship. And it's worth exploring because let's begin with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I hope you can hear it. So Arnold Schwarzenegger pumping iron, milk is for babies. When you grow up, you drink beer. Now, <coughs> Arnold, <coughs> sorry, I'm coughing in your ears. Um, Arnold, uh, like great physique, and I don't know how much beer he was drinking, but but uh, beer does have. I mean, let's get the insulin response, you know, aside and and very high glycemic carbs in 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 beer, but alcohol has an interaction with mTOR. And what mTOR is, again, mammalian or mechanistic target of rapamycin, mTOR sounds like a cool name, but it's remarkably stupid uh, because target of rapamycin, rapamycin isn't even in you. Uh, that's like, it's just it's exogenous chemical. And macrolide. It's just this, it's this exogenous chemical. And when people are identifying how stuff works in the body, all right, let's introduce a drug. And that drug is going to have an effect in the body. And I guess it's like calling GLUT4, right? Glucose transporter 4. That's a reasonable name because there's multiple glutes, you know, GLUT2, there's GLUT5, there's, there's a bunch of these glutes. GLUT4. But if you were to call GLUT4, target of insulin. That's kind of stupid, right? Well, actually, that's less stupid because insulin is in your body. You, you endogenously make insulin. Uh, rapamycin isn't even in your body. So mTOR is sort of a stupid name, but really important enzyme, mTOR. Now, complex one is the critical regulator of skeletal muscle mass. Uh, testosterone works a little bit differently. Testosterone does work through mTOR, but that's a secondary effect. Uh, and, and in part, that's through um, a teamwork with, with IGF, with insulin-like growth factor. But uh, the major mode of regulation of skeletal muscle mass is mTOR complex one. If you turn on mTOR complex one, you are piecing back together your Humpty Dumpty tissues. If you've banged up some tissue on a tennis court and in a boxing ring in the, you know, on the track, in the weight room, it, whatever. If, if you have, you know, garbaged up some, some tissue, that's how you put it back together. If you're exercising and you wanna get bigger, that's how you grow. Turn on mTOR complex one. Downstream from that, now it's a kinase. Uh, the mTOR enzyme is a kinase. A kinase phosphorylates stuff. It attaches a phosphate to something. That's what a kinase does. It attaches phosphates to things. And mTOR attaches phosphates to... Um, uh, what's called P70S6K and 4EBP1. It, it, it puts phosphates on things that turns on P70S6K, which again is another kinase and a phosphorylate is another thing. It phosphorylates what's called ribosomal protein S6. Um, but now we are turning on protein synthesis. We're turning on translation, the linking together of those amino acids. Earlier when I said, you know, these proteins are strings of amino acids. So now here's this amino acid, and then that 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 amino acid, and then a stop code on, right? Now get out of here, go be a protein, go fold up and do your, do your duty. Turning on that process, turning on translation, mTOR, is, is phosphorylating the stuff that's gonna turn it on. mTOR also phosphorylates uh, that 4-EBP1 I just said a second ago. And, and that's, the, that's, that's withholding translation. That's an inhibitor. That's a negative regulator of, of translation of protein synthesis. And, and when mTOR phosphorylates it, it shuts off the negative regulation. So it permits, uh, uh, it, it permits translation to turn on. So it turns on the thing that turns on translation. It turns off the thing that's turning off translation. So there's one, you know, a couple double positive and there's one double negative, a couple of positives there. So mTOR. Now there's, there's a lot of regulation of mTOR. 
get tons of things are regulating mTOR, especially actually, especially on both sides. Uh, amino acids, there are very specific amino acids. Earlier, I talked about the 20 um, when we were saying glutamate and lysine and our aldehyde dehydrogenase. Um, glutamate and, and lysine, you do a little swap and you get this weird version of, of that aldehyde or acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And uh, there, are, there are specific amino, amino acids where if you eat them, leucine matters a great deal. Arginine is its runner up. That's leucine's runner up. Lysine also matters. Um, if you just eat those three, you're going to get 90% of the mobilization, 90% of the activity of mTOR if you just eat those three out of the 20. If you eat all 20, that's wonderful. But if you eat leucine, lysine, and arginine, you're going to get about 90% of the, of the activity of, of eating the whole protein. Uh, methionine, there's, there's a transport. I mean, there's a recognition of that in the cell too, stuff like that. But, but you have to eat a bunch of, of, of protein to move the mTOR complex to the lysosome. Um, a lysosome is an organelle in the cell. It has a bunch of, of uh, like proteolytic enzymes. I mean, this is, this is um, a lysosome is going to do some lysing. And, but the mTOR complex, mTOR complex one, for it to actually work, it has to work at the job site. You have to mobilize mTOR from wherever the hell it is you know, slumbering out in the cell somewhere to the lysosome. And you do that by, by providing protein. In particular, um, some representative amino acids. You don't need every single amino acid. There's just a few important ones. And the body, you did, your, your, your genes did not uh, assemble themselves. Your genome did not uh, develop in the age of chemistry labs where you can isolate leucine and, and arginine and lysine and stuff. So you, you see those amino acids and the body thinks you've eaten a whole protein. Um, it doesn't need to keep tabs on every single possible amino acid entering a cell. Or if you're arginine, it, it can detect it in the lysosome as well. Um, so you introduce some amino acids and, and, and the mTOR complex yeah, docks on the lysosome. And then you, you activate it and you activate it with stuff like insulin and you activate it with stuff like IGF, you activate it with stuff like prostaglandins, um, you, active, you, you activate it with all these growth factors. So you need both of those things to happen and that's how you're going to grow. Um, a little bit more mTOR talk and then we'll talk about where alcohol comes in. So just upstream from mTOR complex one, complex two is actually also upstream from complex one because it turns on a thing called PKB, AKT or PKB, mTOR complex two phosphorylates activates um, uh, PKB. But immediately upstream from complex one, PKB, protein kinase B, it's a kinase, phosphorylates this guy, tuberin, tuberous sclerosis complex or tuberin. And tuberin is facilitating the hydrolysis of GTP, guanine triphosphate. Think ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is guanine triphosphate. It, it, it um, causes the, the hydrolysis of this to GDP. So that's what tuberin is doing. It's taking this GTP and converting to GDP. Now REB, Ross homolog enriched in brain, REB is going to uh, bind to activating mTOR, uh, the mTOR enzyme itself, the, the, the kinase, the mTOR kinase enzyme. And uh, you can only do it when it has GTP. So PKB, protein kinase B, sometimes called AKT, about half the time it's called AKT. Uh, but PKB is the better uh, contemporary name, AKT. It was named after just like mTOR, target of rapamycin, because you introduce a drug and a publication comes out of it. Um, but with um, AKT, it was named because it was a, a, a mouse that, that got thymus cancer, thymoma. And that's what the T stands for. And whatever, AK, I think, is like the identification of the mouse. You know, what, what mouse is that? Oh, there's, you know, AB, there's AC, there's AK, there's whatever, right? And so you can read that history of it yourself, but it, the AKT is a stupid name. Uh, PKB, much better. Protein kinase B. There's lots of protein kinases. 
this protein kinase A, super catabolic in the body, protein kinase A mobilizes energy substrates. Let's, let's chop up a bunch of carbs and throw them into circulation. Let's chop up a bunch of fat, and throw it into circulation. Let's get ready to metabolize this stuff. Protein kinase A, super catabolic. Protein kinase B, super anabolic. And in part, in most, not just in part, but in most, uh, PKB, protein kinases B, uh, B's uh, activity is through uh, deactivating tuberin. It deactivates TSC2, deactivates tuberin. And so REB is allowed to turn on mTOR. REB can turn on mTOR. And this won't happen if mTOR isn't at the lysosomal surface. You need to actually get mTOR to the lysosome. So you have to actually have your proteins uh, uh, you have to eat a little bit of protein, have some protein available to mo to to uh, translocate mTOR to the work site, to the workstation, to the lysosome, and then PKB can, can activate and you're going to start uh, translating proteins. Now downstream from complex one, mTOR complex one, here you see uh, PKB right here. It's in this diagram. It's called AKT, but uh, PKB, protein kinase B, and it's you know inhibiting tuberin, REB. Tuberin is inhibiting REB, preventing REB from turning on mTOR by you know, facilitating the hydrolysis of the GTP to GDP. Um, but downstream from mTOR complex one, I get multiple names for things. Uh, S6K, uh, P70S6K is usually what it's called. Um, that's a kinase, it phosphorylates stuff. That's ribosomal protein S6. Usually it's called RPS6 for ribosomal protein S6. And over here we have 4EBP1, which is inhibiting uh, protein synthesis, protein translation, AKA hypertrophy, AKA you're growing, right? Anabolism, whatever you wanna call that down there. So the critical regulator of muscle growth and regeneration and, and repair, remodeling and, and hypertrophy and all of all of these things, the critical regulator of this is mTOR. And there's a lot of stuff that you can put in your mouth, supplements, uh, foods, alcohol, that can adjust, that can alter mTOR activity. So alcohol, if you're going to put alcohol in your mouth, one of the things it does, this is, you know, skeletal muscle uh, protein synthesis, where we have, um, you know, here's the protein synthesis over here, and uh, ETOH, this is ethanol. This over here is ethanol, right? The, the black one. The black one is is subjects have ethanol. Um, the white one over here is control. There's no ethanol here. And what we're looking at is is uh, protein synthesis and the difference in the ethanol and non-ethanol group um, at 30 minutes, um, non-stimulation as compared to stimulation at four hours, non-stimulation as opposed to stimulation, and at 12 hours non-stimulation compared to stimulation. So protein synthesis, how much protein you're making, that's what hypertrophy is, that's what growth is, that's what anabolism is, is you're making proteins. It, you're not like, you know, it's, it's not, I don't know, hyperplasia or whatever. Sure, that exists a little bit. I'm sure it does. There's the, in humans, it's harder to find compelling evidence that it exists, but it's hard not to believe it. Um, it's just the experiments, it's sort of hard to run those experiments. But uh, hypertrophy and growth and responses to exercise and getting stronger and all this stuff, uh, the bulk of this is a bunch of hypertrophy, it's protein translation. And when you see experiments like this, like 12 hours later, I mean, do you even have any alcohol left in your system? I mean, is your blood alcohol content down to zero at this point? And we're still seeing differences, you know, and so we see this this impairing of mTOR, an impairing of protein translation in the presence of, again, that's ethanol over here. So stimulation, non-stimulation, you know, uh, let's, let's make this muscle contract versus uh, not make the muscle contract. And so there's the control group, and then there's the, the ethanol group, um, where S6K1, right, or, or P7, the S6K, um, and so when you get into stimulation, um, how much of this 
enzyme, this kinase immediately downstream from mTOR is, is being phosphorylated. These are phosphorylation sites. Uh, the control, an awful lot. Ethanol, yeah, a little over half, but, but that's not good, right? Um, mTOR enzyme itself, uh, we're seeing uh, a little bit lower. These are both PKB. These are just different phosphorylation sites on PKB. We're seeing uh, ethanol group going down. So you introduce ethanol and your PKB and your mTOR. So the, 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 the cascade, let's just call it the, the interstate five, the I-5 of protein translation, because there's other ways to initiate translation too. This isn't the only road to that destination. There are other roads, but this is I-5. This is the major corridor. This is the major like 50 lane highway uh, that goes from you know, your mouth to your growing biceps or whatever. And looking at the same stuff, right? Um, the uh, control group stimulation and you know S6K, the P70 S6K, the this this kinase that's downstream from mTOR that's so valued, so close to uh, you're growing now. If you're if you phosphorylated this thing, um, you're growing like now. And look at that um, at the amount of of phosphorylation. And what that difference is, you know, I mean, this is this is 12 hours uh, after, 12 hours after your uh, stimulation and and your your um, your ethanol, and you were still seeing these major uh, major differences. Um, ribosomal protein S6. Um, earlier there was a diagram that just said S6, and I said sometimes it's RPS6 because it's a ribosomal protein ribosome that's where the translation actually happens if you can think of uh, translation as cooking up a dish with a recipe it's the kitchen a ribosome is the kitchen and you take your rna there you take your recipe and you say cook up my omelet with the stuff in it you know here's my denver omelet with whatever and the ribosome is that kitchen that does the cooking that that, that cooks up your dish that makes your proteins. And so that's where that happens. And so when you see ribosomal protein S6, okay, we're talking translation here. We're talking the, the making, the synthesizing of a, of a protein. Um, and so that protein too, now it's a little bit closer to the 12 hour mark, the RPS6. But um, by, you know, early on, in the for a while after and they're looking at even the 12 hour mark after ethanol what we're seeing is compromised muscle regeneration compromised uh, muscle protein synthesis um, compromised mTOR activity so the metabolic consequence of ethanol in this circumstance in these conditions with these goals if your goal is muscle gain not good Right, alcohol isn't good for this for this context, um, and this is just a, this is a nice characterization. Same article, it's just a nice characterization of it, uh, talking about um, the you know the different anabolic stimuli. You know, we hypothesize that the contraction induced increase in muscle protein synthesis would be maintained in the presence of alcohol, since muscle contraction activates mTOR complex one independent of pathways previously identified to be inhibited by alcohol, including PI3K, PKB. These are different things. Uh, phosphatidyl and nosotol, three kinase. This is another kinase. Remember, a kinase phosphorylates stuff. This is upstream from uh, AKT or PKB. Um, technically, you don't, you don't need to know like this level of detail, but technically for this class, you don't need to know it. Um, PI3K, it phosphorylates a thing called PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol, bisphosphate, two phosphates. It has a third phosphate to it. So it becomes PIP3. PIP2 becomes PIP3. And that, that permits the activation of PKB by a thing called PDK. Um, but we have this canonical signal of, of mTOR activation. This is how insulin works. This is what insulin does. Insulin binds to a cell surface receptor. Right? Insulin is a protein hormone, a polypeptide. It's a string of amino acids. It can't just get into the cell. Insulin is a, is a polypeptide hormone. It's a bunch of amino acids. And a steroid hormone could just wiggle itself into the cell and be happy there. A polypeptide hormone has to bind to a cell surface receptor. Um, so insulin binds to a cell surface receptor. 
you get PI3K activated, then you activate PKB, and then from that you get all your insulin effects. You get the anabolism, you, you get mobilization of GLUT4, you know, all of those effects that we know about for insulin, even the blocking of fat metabolism. Uh, you, you know, do you want to burn a bunch of fat? Get insulin out of your system. You don't want to have insulin in your system if you're trying to burn fat. Well, why is that? Well, because insulin is going to activate this pathway, PI3K, PKB, and both of these things are going to activate a thing called PDE, phosphodiesterase. For the longest time, people said just PKB did it, um, but then you can introduce a PKB inhibitor and you still see an activation of, of PDE. So phosphodiesterase, what does that do? Phosphodiesterase halts um, activation of PKA. And Earl, five, 10 minutes ago, I said PKA mobilizes your energy substrates. Protein kinase A gets all those energy substrates going. So that lipolysis, right? Lipid lysis, lipolysis. Do you want to burn fat? Well, you got to chop it up first. And if you activate PDE, phosphodiesterase, you convert cyclic AMP into AMP. Cyclic AMP activates PKA. AMP does not. So you get rid of its activation. Um, so insulin has a ton of effects, but, but it's going to go through this cascade. Now, the interesting part here is that, you know, uh, we hypothesize that contraction induced increase in muscle protein synthesis would be maintained in the presence of alcohol. Since muscle contraction activates mTOR independent of pathways previously identified to be inhibited by alcohol, including uh, PKB and or hormonal stimulation. And most hormonal stimulation is, is just going to go through this pathway. So these are and hormonal stimulation. These two are really coupled. But mechanical signaling is uncoupled. Now, technically, mechanical signaling does activate PI3KPKB. That pathway mechanical signaling does do it in part by facilitating uh, MGF, mechano growth factor, uh, insulin like growth factor. That's it's an um, autocrine version. It's a, the muscle releases it and helps itself out, right? It's just not a full endocrine version that gets out in the blood, but. But also mechanical activation of a tissue works through things called integrins. I think we talked about that earlier this uh, semester. I think we, we talked about integrins, uh, which are integrating the intracellular environment and the extracellular uh, environment, that extracellular matrix, and, and they're relaying messages indoors. And so integrins will sense mechanical stimulation and relay that inside of the cell through this thing called focal adhesion kinase. And, and, and you'll get this mechanical specific activation of mTOR. I'm saying more than you need to know here. So don't panic if, if like, oh my God, I need to know all the, yeah, this is, I'm just trying to paint a huge picture of, of what mTOR is. So as we talk about alcohol, there will be some familiar names that, that we're discussing. Um, but you know, so, so integrins are going to activate mTOR through like phosphatidic acid, PA, phosphatidic acid, some mechanisms independent of the signaling cascade. And yet we still see, even with mechanical stimulation, we still see alcohol inhibiting, ethanol inhibiting protein synthesis, skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So contrary to our expectations, right, the data show that alcohol impairs mechanical activation of mTOR, uh, similar to other previously reported anabolic stimuli. So we have, we have something going on here with ethanol that is pretty potent in this study and in, and in some studies that preceded it. Um, it's pretty potent in terms of its inhibition of protein synthesis, its impairing of mTOR activity. Um, and they looked at a lot of things, you know, and it's, it's uh, 12 hours later, you know, blood alcohol content has returned to undetectable levels 12 hours later, and they're still seeing phosphorylation differences in meaningful places, phosphorylation differences at meaningful sites when alcohol is undetectable. So there seems to be a sort of a prolonged effect on the, me the metabolism, the anabolism, the metabolic signals for, for growth and, and uh, amassing of, of tissue. All right, new one. Uh, so maybe that's a good thing. That's what this article is saying. That last article, uh, what, what we're getting at is that's terrible. 
you know, that's sort of the, the perspective that you can draw from it, from, from an athlete's perspective, from, a, from somebody who's going to the weight room, somebody who wants to get an extra pull up in next week, somebody who, um, you know, wants to perform better in something. Yeah, you need a bunch of mTOR signaling. That's what you need if you want to perform better in this thing. If you want to perform better in anything except for like a triathlon or a marathon or something, then you need some mTOR signaling and ethanol is going to inhibit that. Um, you know, that's, you know, babies drink your milk. Uh, milk is, is going to help activate mTOR. At least it's going to mobilize it to the, to the lysosomal surface, right? The milk will, you, you'll, you'll get all that protein in there, um, with a nice composition of amino acids to help mobilize to the, what's called RAG GTP aces, mobilize mTOR to the lysosomal surface. And then, uh, there's some carbs in milk, you know, 12, 13 grams of carbohydrates. And those carbs are going to get a little bit of an insulin response. And so now you have that insulin response. Insulin will do the PI3K, PKB signaling. Oh, magic. We have mTOR turned on, right? Milk is milk is, is good for sort of a bodybuilding or exercise community and and get that full fat milk if, if you want some of those growth factors in the in the in the fat. Uh, wonderful stuff, uh, milk for for growth. Beer though okay we have some ethanol in the beer and like yeah okay there's some carbs you might get a little bit of insulin response there's no protein in the beer and you have the ethanol to inhibit mTOR uh now so I don't know that Arnold but, but it's like mTOR it wasn't even a thing then nobody had any idea how that shit worked um during the age of of you know Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno nobody had any idea that this stuff even existed so all all relatively new um, the understanding of the basis of metabolism. So when people talk about metabolism, um, commonly uh, what, what gets thought of is things like glycolysis and the, trans, the electron transport chain, Krebs cycle, stuff like that. But metabolism is all your chemical reactions and it's a summation of, of you know, anabolism, catabolism, and, and the balance of those things. And, and what is the balance of anabolism, catabolism? Well, they meet in the middle at mTOR. mTOR is the hub of all metabolism in, um, in you. And so M mTOR is, is sort of the linchpin or whatever. It's this critical point of all of your metabolism. It's this balance of anabolism, catabolism. And if you turn it on too much, you die, right? I mean, there are mouse models. You just turn this thing on and just don't let it shut off and, and don't live very long. I mean, grow, grow, grow. And remember in, I don't know, lecture five, lecture six, somewhere around there, uh, where I said the body is very conservative. And you don't want to respond to exercise with protein synthesis because this is half your your you know ballpark figure half half of your of your cells metabolic expense is make a protein right protein translation is like the most expensive thing you can do and the body doesn't want to do it if it doesn't have to now what causes the body to make proteins what causes the body to empty its bank account mTOR mTOR is this boss that says, all right, go drain your account. Like holds a gun to the person standing at the ATM and says, give me all your money. The mTOR is doing that. Now it invests the money in cool, powerful things, but it drains your account. mTOR, that shit is expensive. And I mean, these cells, if you're translating proteins, oh yeah, you better get some food in your mouth. I mean, and if you don't get enough food in your, if you just turn mTOR on and like leave the light on all night, you're going to die. Right, you can't afford that, um, and there's mouse models that show that the sort of runaway train metabolism, um, and so we regulate this really tightly. Uh, burns a ton of calories, but really turns things on. Now, in this regulation, the inhibition of mTOR is a major, major focus for your oncologist. Right. So if you or your, you know, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, cousins, grandpa, what, I don't know, um, who, I don't know, that's like the same person as you, um, but your, whoever in, in your peer group, your friends and family, if you know somebody with heart disease, if you know somebody especially with cancer, you don't want mTOR on. You want to shut mTOR on, uh, off. You, you shut down that 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 um, growth mode. Because what is cancer? Right? Well, I mean, before the you know, metastases and the spreads, of it, we get this uh, like dysregulation. We we get this growth. It just sort of this is I I did not eat anything and I'm growing. You know, this is this is this um, excess of growth. mTOR 
activation. I mean, we're, we're looking at this at these regulatory problems. And so if you can inhibit mTOR in the oncology ward, let's make it kind of old and cold and the, that, that sort of frigid vernacular, in the oncology ward, uh, if you can inhibit mTOR, that's a good thing. Now, people will say alcohol, great for heart health. You've heard this, right? Drink a glass of red wine every night and it's great for your heart health. And then people will cite things, and I'm going to talk about wine here in just a minute, but people will cite things like resveratrol, uh, which is a thing in grapes, right? You can just eat the grapes. You know, they don't need to be like fermented. Um, they don't, you don't need to get wasted to get your resveratrol. <clears throat> but uh, so people will cite stuff like that and say, this is the reason it's so heart healthy. Resveratrol, uh, if you, in, you know, introduce enough of this to physiology, resveratrol is going to mimic uh, the biological response of, of, you know, sort of a partial starvation. Do you want to not fast, but get the benefits of fasting? You know, here's some stuff that you can take. So some of these sorts of responses we're seeing uh, like resveratrol. So people will cite that and say, this is heart healthy. Resveratrol, drink your glass of red wine every night. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot to unpack with alcohol and health, longevity, lifespan, health span, all of these things. What's fascinating though, is it's not just wine. I mean, these are just like winos who say that. These, these are these are people who um, are trying to defend their lifestyle. Say, no, 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 a glass of red wine every day. Yeah, but you're like fucking wasted every day. That's not the same thing as a glass of red wine. Um, I mean, so th that's, or it's like the actual vineyard has some like advertisement or, or what, you know, and so you have to look past some of the sales pitches. You have to look past some of the marketing of the stuff and just say, what is it that you're drinking? Well, it's rum. Remember, I'm a poor person. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, I'm right there with you and you're heart healthy too. You know, what are you drinking? Oh, vodka. Well, does it have Skittles in it or something gross and weird like that? Nope. Just straight vodka. I don't have too much of it. Okay. Heart health. You know, it doesn't have to be red wine every, or whatever it is that people say. Now it's beer isn't all that helpful. Um, and, you know, the mixed drink that like, I can barely taste the alcohol and it, you know, it gives you diabetes in one shot. Like that's not helpful, right? But alcohol, ethanol seems to impart some sort of uh, protective effect. And part of this is going to be its effect on, on mTOR. And I'll talk about ethanol and red wine in, in just a minute, but uh, in part, when people say heart health and sort of this, this longevity and health span and, and, you know, oh my, whatever, my blood pressure is so good. And I mean, that's like often what people will go to of, of oh, how's your heart health? Oh, my blood pressure is 116 over 76 or whatever. People are like proud and celebrating and they don't even really know what that means. Um, but the person who never accepts a single drink of anything and they can smell it in the room next door and are pissed at everybody. How dare you bring that sin into this household? Now, this is in my house, you know, you bring a drop of liquor into my house, you know, that type of response where people try to control everybody else and God forbid, um, you know, their mouthwash has a, has, you know, a fraction of a drip of alcohol in it and whatever. It's like homeopathically alcoholed in their, in their mouthwash. Those people measure their blood pressure. It's like 500 over, you know, 450. Um, there's a stress response to that type of mentality. Does that have anything to do with ethanol or is that just the type of person who has a disposition? the type of person who is violently and vehemently opposed to the ingestion of alcohol, okay, relax a little bit, right? Be like a normal person who isn't suffering from this lethal anxiety and, and your blood pressure is going to come down. And what, what does a more relaxed person look like? Oh, sure. I'll try that. You know, what's, what's in the glass? Yeah. Yeah. Give me a sip. That's what a relaxed person's like, right? And their blood pressure uh, corresponds. And what, like somebody who just goes crazy, that's not healthy either, right? Okay, your liver's a disaster. And, and like, I mean, and so there's a, there's, 
there are extremes on both sides that correspond with health deficits. The normal, healthy-minded person, yeah, sure, yeah, I drink a glass of red wine every, you know, a couple times a week or whatever, like, fine, yeah. So that's going to be part of the effect, is the type of person who, it's not the ethanol itself that is imbuing the you know, magical um, uh, health you, you know, like you're just shielding the body from every possible health deficit. It's the emotional constitution of the person who drinks responsibly. That's healthy. That's a healthy thing to do. That's healthful. Um, that said, ethanol, if you can inhibit mTOR, there are several longevity associated health benefits, both heart health and certainly um, kind of warding off carcinogenic uh, effects. So, um, you know, malignancies and, and, and looking, looking at these at uh, cancer, right? Lymphoma and, and you know, large B cell lymphoma. So, so this is a, a, a specific, uh, a very narrow kind of population and, and consideration here. The, a great, great intro here to what mTOR is. Now they say mechanistic, target of rapamycin. That's fine. Whatever. You know, I, I, again, I think the name mTOR is, it sounds cool, mTOR. I mean, it sounds like powerful and stuff, but the name is, as I said earlier, is kind of stupid because target of rapamycin and rapamycin is an exogenous thing. And it was just like a drug that like, oh, we administer this thing. And um, here's the thing that it targets in the body. It's called FKBP12, that are part of mTOR complex. Um, but here's this thing it targets in the body. We'll call it target of rapamycin. Yeah, well, it turns out to be the hub of all human metabolism. Uh, maybe we shouldn't call it target of rapamycin anymore. Maybe we should call it like, you know, soul, the, per, like person's soul. That's probably closer to its, to the, its real name is like, you know, where's the seat of the soul in a human being? Uh, mTOR. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really incredibly important. And so calling it this is is... Um, almost derogatory of, of, of its role in, in, in all of metabolism. I mean, it's just the foundation of metabolism at this point. Uh, mTOR and its, and its sort of corresponding team, the, the complex and its sort of upstream and downstream and then that little hub. Um, but so this is a nice little paragraph in this article where that's introducing you know, what its role is. And there's mTOR complex one and complex two. This is a little bit broader and it's sort of cell survival stuff and where your ions are going, things like that. But mTOR complex two actually activates complex one. Complex one so much better understood and this is the, like your growing stuff. Um, so again, the great, great article from a... Uh, the sort of long-winded explanations of not just the diagrams, but it characterizes things very, very well here. So they you know the potential of mTOR signaling with regard to other cellular processes. Um, there's, a, there's a therapy, there's a possible therapy when we're looking at uh, diabetes and obesity and neurodegeneration, we're looking at cancer, um, heart disease, we're looking at all these conditions and interacting with mTOR. Uh, turning off mTOR in this case is going to be very helpful. It's going to be very helpful too to deactivate mTOR uh, for these things. Is it going to make you a terrible athlete to do that? Yes, it'll make you a terrible athlete. Are you going to live longer? Yes. What's more important to you? Well, if you're a 20-year-old athlete, a 22-year-old athlete, a 25-year-old athlete, a 16-year-old athlete, you want as much mTOR as you can get. If you're a 45-year-old whose you know, dad died at 52 of, of cardiovascular disease and, and your mom died of cancer or something like that, nah, you don't want as much mTOR anymore, right? So it depends on what your goal is. Uh, in life. It just, it's going to depend on what your um, sort of where you are in your life and what your kind of aspirations are. Now, this is a, a major mTOR inhibitor. You don't need to know what this is. This isn't, you know, alcohol. But, you know, we found that in contrast to this, you know, big inhibitor, which induced com uh, complete inhibition of mTOR complex 1 and complex 2, ethanol, the EDOH, ethanol decreased mTOR complex 1 activity and complex formation uh, while concurrently activating AKT phosphorylation M mTOR complex 2 assembly. Now, AKT, that's PKB. PKB is downstream from complex two. So if you activate complex two, you're gonna activate complex one. Um, and it, there may be a chronic effect here. And at the very end today, I'm gonna to talk about potential differences in chronic versus acute, because a lot of this is talking about acute and there's more to say chronically, but we don't really know much yet. Um, but so he, this is what it looks like. Again, this is ethanol and blocking complex one. 
mTOR, blocking complex one activity. But there's a mild promotion of complex two. Downstream from complex one is activation of AKT. AKT activates mTOR uh, complex one. So, but we're inhibiting that. Now, there's a few areas in which ethanol is exerting uh, its effect. So one of those, one possible area here, is the raptor mTOR complex, the disruption of, of this. So, um, so for raptor right here, what raptor is doing is actually recruiting these downstream targets. Remember P70 S6K or S6K, that's the kinase that phosphorylates um, uh, ribosomal protein S6. And these arrows look kind of weird because mTOR, Raptor recruits these things for EBP1 and P70S6K so that mTOR, the kinase, the thing that phosphorylates stuff, these are phosphates, these little P's, can attach its P's to stuff. Now, when mTOR attaches a P to this one, it shuts it off. So it makes sense that you would see this line as like, where? no, absolutely not. But over here, mTOR is turning this on. So that's, that's actually stupid. That line doesn't belong that way. Same thing with this. That, that should be a positive arrow because mTOR, the kinase, phosphorylates this. That's what that phosphate is, which turns it on. And this phosphorylates this, which turns it on. And then we're, we're doing protein translation downstream from that stuff. And this is what's inhibiting protein translation over here. So it shuts that off. And ethanol is... Uh, inhibiting that. Um, and so that the the ethanol decreased raptor mTOR association while increasing Richter mTOR complex formation. Um, so if raptor is unable to recruit its downstream targets, how does mTOR phosphorylate them? Well, it doesn't, right? It's, it doesn't just, it, it's like a sharpshooter and it has to have a target. You have to bring the target in front of you and then it you know, shoots its phosphate onto it. Um, it doesn't just like, well, you know, let me um, write a note in a bottle and throw it in the ocean and hope it gets to the person I'm, I addressed. That That's not going to work, right? So you need the recruiter. And so if ethanol is impairing uh, activity with the recruitment of the downstream targets, that could potentially obstruct mTOR complex one. Now, this is, this is all relatively young research. The understanding isn't perfect on any of this, but but uh, Raptor is one uh, role, uh, one role that's been identified. And another one for ethanol to impair mTOR complex one activity is uh, the phosphorylation of 4-EBP1. Um, 4-EBP1 uh, binds to this EIF4E, doesn't matter, but that's the inhibitory uh, side of mTOR. That's, that's, that's the how mTOR gets inhibited or how uh, protein translation gets inhibited uh, is through that pathway and mTOR phosphorylates it which shuts it off so you shut off the thing that's shutting off growth great for cancer I mean great for um, growth horrible for cancer right you want uh, uh, withholding, you want impairment, you want restriction on growth in the presence of cancer if, if you're if what you want to do is grow that's wonderful but um, ethanol is seems to be impairing that part as well. Now, all of that said, the long-term stuff, if you get into longer term, not just acute, but longer term, there may be room for differences in what's happening with mTOR. Now, this is mice. And so this is just mice and they get them wasted. Okay, so at four weeks old, the mice, they either have, have diets of just water where they drink a bunch of water or they just get them wasted, right? 10% ethanol. I mean, that's like a, that's like a French wine. Um, that's like a nice mellow um, Beaujolais or something, whatever. Uh, that, that's like a nice, like, I don't know, mellow wine. And, and, and what you see is um, S6, ribosomal protein S6, you're seeing this increase uh, in ribosomal protein S6 and in the um, uh, amount of it, I mean, you're upregulating this thing in mice who are wasted chronically. And so th there's potential to say, okay, maybe we're suppressing mTOR acutely. And so what is the response to acute suppression? Well, let's make more of the proteins. 
right? Let's increase the concentration of these proteins. Let's increase the expression of these proteins. And what would happen if you increase the expression, the concentration, the amount of all of these proteins? Well, then you're going to get some, some stimulation. And uh, so this was seizure frequency, and this was the um, ribosomal protein S6. And you, yeah, they did see it. You know, there's something There's something to comment on there. Now, the last thing, um, so, so acutely, what it seems like is mTOR is inhibited by ethanol. And my hunch is the chronic effects don't really offset that. Uh, but there's, there's room to say. That's the only study I've, I've seen that, that has anything really compelling to say. And it's just, let's get mice chronically wasted. And so I, it's, it's hard to say a person drinking wine or whatever is going to experience the same effect. Last thing I'll talk about, just a few slides on wine. What I said earlier about resveratrol. Resveratrol, compound in grapes, and thus it's in wine. And what resveratrol is doing, it's facilitating LKB1, that's liver kinase B1, LKB1. Don't think of it as a liver enzyme. It's ubiquitous. It just happens to be called liver kinase B1. But LKB1 is activating AMPK. Now, AMPK, adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase, it would seem adenosine monophosphate, AMP. It's AMP activated protein kinase. It seems AMP would be activating it. Well, it is. AMP has to bind to AMPK, which permits activation by LKB1. So once you bind AMP to AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase, this is a kinase, it phosphorylates stuff, um, then you, uh, that permits the actual activation by LKB1. And that's what resveratrol is doing is, is, is it's facilitating AMPK activation by LKB1. Now, once you have activated AMPK, AMPK is a reasonable argument for the single most catabolic enzyme in your entire body. PKA is probably its runner up. AMPK, probably, I would argue, this would be my, if, if I were choosing the kickball team, I'm team captain, I'm kickball team, and what I want is the most, is the, the enzyme that will just rip shit up and just, and break everything down, be the most catabolic thing you could ever have. I, I, my first choice is going to be AMPK. My, my second choice is going to be, um, if I get to round two in the draft pick or something like that, I'll be sure, give me PKA or whatever. Um, but AMPK, super catabolic. And so, but it's a kinase, right? Prote it's a um, AMP activated protein kinase. So it is going to phosphorylate stuff. What's it attaching phosphates to? Tuberin. You've seen tuberin before. Remember, tuberin is the thing that's shutting off REB that's hydrolyzing its GTP so that REB can't activate mTOR. So what AMPK is doing is promoting tuberin which means it's shutting off mTOR. What else is AMPK doing? Well, it's inhibiting Raptor and Raptor would be recruiting the downstream targets so that mTOR could phosphorylate them. Okay, so there are two, it's no, one isn't enough. One bullet hole to the chest, that's not enough. There's a bullet hole to the head too. That's what AMPK is doing. It's like, you know what? I could kind of inhibit uh, mTOR. I could, I could half-ass it and just put a bullet hole in the chest, but I don't know, maybe, maybe mTOR is wearing a Kevlar vest. I don't know, here's face two. That's what AMPK does. It phosphorylates both tuberin and raptor and shuts off mTOR by two means over here. So you're not growing once you turn on AMPK. And remember resveratrol, that thing that makes wine so healthy, what people say, well, really the attitude of the drinker is, is, is what makes wine healthier, I would argue. And ethanol may have other effects, you know, with um, whether it's through uh, raptor or whether it is um, through 4-EBP1 right, through this, through mTOR's activation of, uh, deactivation, it's phosphorylation of, of 4 ebp one So ethanol, there's going to be some effects. AMPK itself is going to have a couple of effects. But AMPK also turns on lysosomal degradation, the ubiquitin proteasome system. So let's degrade proteins, um, forkhead, box O, foxo. Um, so it's going to phosphorylate stuff that turns on atrophy. So AMPK turns on atrophy and turns off growth. And that's what resveratrol is doing. So that's that's the grape thing and the wine thing. Now I'm not saying eat a grape and you shrink, right? But um, there's there's some uh, a couple of studies that have been really good. Um, Benoit Violet, that's the, the senior author here, the last author in, in, in these things, this is out of his lab. And 
<clears throat> looking at mice who are deficient in AMPK, they get pretty huge. They develop musculature really, they're very, very responsive to exercise. And then if you increase AMPK, you're going to facilitate atrophy. So um, uh, low levels of, of AMPK, you're going to get big levels of, of muscle. Big levels of AMPK, you're going to get little levels of, of muscle. And so that would be the extent of, of alcohol interaction with athleticism, uh, exercise responses, metabolism. Do we have any questions? Are we eager to start weekending, to start drinking and blocking mTOR? I have a question about the AMK, AMPK pathway and um diabetics who take metformin, could they take resveratrol to kind of like offset the AMP deaminase or anything? Most like likely, that? really good question. Yeah, it's gonna help, it's not as powerful. Um, metformin, super powerful, that drug. Uh, and so as you know, I think, um, the the metformin for everybody else, what metformin is doing, which is the same, other than insulin, Metformin is the number one diabetes drug in the world, second to insulin. Now, what metformin is doing, it blocks AMP deaminase. AMP deaminase is um, eliminating, is deaminasing AMP, adenosine monophosphate. So you go through a bunch of exercise, right? And you chop up your ATP. You combine two ADPs, the phosphates. You steal one phosphate from one ADP. It's called the adenylic kinase reaction. You take one phosphate from an ADP and give it to the other one. It's sort of like this Robin Hood who robs from the middle class to give to the middle class to make a poor and a rich. That's like actually what Robin Hood in real life does. Um, the, the sort of, not his, history's Robin Hood, but, but um, that's sort of what happens in real life is like how people get rich and poor. But um, the, so, so you chop up your ATP, you get a couple of ADPs, one, eight, when you make an AMP out of it through the dental and kinase reaction. Now you have a bunch of AMP. Remember, AMP is what activates AMPK. AMPK is the most catabolic enzyme in the body, says me. Um, you can argue something else and I'll, I'll go with you, but, um, so you get a bunch of AMP, AMP, a couple of AMPs, but you bind one and it changes conformation. So the other one binds like immediately. Um, AMP binds to, to AMPK. That permits LKB1 to activate it. Now, what you normally do is you build up AMP is you dispose of it. You have AMP deaminase. You dispose of your AMP, dispose of your, as you build up AMP, you dispose of it. Metformin blocks that disposal enzyme. It blocks AMP deaminase. So your AMP levels build up, build up, build up, build up. And so what happens? More and more and more and more binds to the AMPK. And so you get more and more AMPK activated. Now metformin, super catabolic, super catabolic drug. But what does AMPK do for metabolism? Way better than insulin. Right, AMPK does insulin's job way better than insulin. Now, earlier this semester, I mentioned when I was saying, earn your calories, you know, go exercise and earn your calories. And, and in the part where we were talking about sedentary behavior and the complications of sedentism, right? Uh, what muscle does to earn its calories, you know, there's a skeletal muscle pump, not reactive hyperemia, whatever, but like the pump where like you walk, you like you squeeze your calves and glutes and hammies and whatever, and it drives blood back to the heart. You squeeze the blood vessels, like little toothpaste tubes to drive the blood ba uh, back to the heart. And, but you also activate your, you, you get a bunch of AMP, you activate AMPK. Now, AMPK means insulin, hang out. I don't need you, right? Those beta cells, you're useless to me. I have AMPK. AMPK is going to mobilize your GLUT4. That's what insulin would be doing. AMPK is going to mobilize GLUT4, bring sugar into the cell. Now, what insulin would be doing is turning on um, glycogen synthase, to synthesize glycogen, to put all those carbs into storage. What does AMPK do? 
super catabolic. Is it going to put stuff into storage? Nope. I'm going to burn that shit immediately. Um, so it gets into the cell. It brings all that sugar into the cell, but then it also activates hexokinase and phosphofructokinase. Both of those are in glycolysis. So you bring sugar into the cell and just burn it, right? So that AMPK for a diabetic, best thing you can activate. Now, metformin is a potent activator. Resveratrol, it's not metformin in its kind of power. Um, but yes, so if somebody has, to, to answer your question sort of less physio less cellularly, um, the, yeah, if somebody has uh, diabetes and they want to reduce, let's say they're type 1, they want to reduce the amount of insulin they're injecting or they're type 2 and they want to try to improve insulin sensitivity the best they can, um, uh, resveratrol is a supplement I would take. Um, let's see if I have some up here. I don't, I don't see any. In, in my house, I have... I have um, I have a bunch of resveratrol. It, it is very, it's not, it's not the, you know, ideal for power athletes and stuff, but, but Cameron, yeah, you're, the situation you brought up is, is a very good one. I have another question about okay. a supplement, milk thistle in the liver. I just started working at, in a vitamins department at Sprouts and like, everyone is just like milk thistle. Oh, so good for your liver and i'm like why don't you just stop drinking <laughs> i'm like that's also great for your liver that's really funny so i i'm just do you know what it like what milk thistle does physiologically on our livers or i i can't answer physiologically here's what i here's what i can say i, I can give you some personal narrative um so i had really severe mold toxicity uh part of the therapy of that, the drugs like kill your liver. And that's okay because as I said, you know, a couple lectures ago, something like that, livers, wonderful healers, those livers, man, they bounce back. You know, I, I gave that really terrible example of kicking a dog. Um, and those livers heal so well. So um, yeah, all right, give me the, give me the mold drugs. And when you look at stuff like your AST, your ALT, how do you tell that your liver's a mess? Now, it's interesting. In the literature, you, you can, there's, a, there's a study that was done on bakers, people who just work with bread all day. And with the bread, there's a bunch of aspergillus. Just, it has it in it. And they have, they're like, drink, they're like alcoholics. Bakers are. Um, when you look at their, like, alanine transfer, uh, transaminase and, like, these, these enzymes, um, the, these liver enzymes that, that you see get released. Now, when, when somebody is under liver stress, um, bilirubin, AST, ALT, there's you know, those specific things you look at. The liver releases those into circulation. So all you need to do is do a little blood work to see if your liver needs any, any helping out. Now, if somebody's taking like milk thistle because it's like, oh, well, it's good for my liver and my liver's fine. Like, well, I don't, what the hell do you think? Um, but you don't have to like surgically open somebody up or like, you know, take a biopsy of the liver. It's easy to see if your liver is under stress. And if somebody is drinking, if somebody is doing oral anabolic steroids, if somebody uh, is taking, you know, there's a lot of different medications uh, are going to go through the liver and that they're going to be hard on the liver. Now, my AST and ALT were huge. They got really high up when I was, when I was on meds. And I was like, Poof, I, you know, I, I don't know if milk thistle works, but I got to start taking shit because I, I got to get this under control. They went down. My ASD and ALT went down. Uh, and I'm, that's an N of one. Yeah, I'm just, uh, <laughs> and it could, maybe it was just going to go down anyway, whatever, you know, so what you want to see is a literature of, of, let's look at, let's look at these liver enzymes that are markers of liver stress and then don't change anything about what the people are doing and introduce milk thistle or, uh, um, uh, like a placebo controlled trial, ha have some sort of, you know, pill of nothing that they, that they take. And I haven't looked at the literature of that and I don't know the mechanisms. I have an N of one that saw my ASD and ALT recover. Um, so maybe it works. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to say. I, I wish I had a better answer to your question. I'll just tell him to buy it anyways to 
get the prices up <laughs> for the company. All right. it, I, I don't, it's not going to hurt. Other questions for today? Um, I wanted to ask about that Matt Foreman, how you're saying it brings the sugar into the cell and then just burns it. Um, is that like a uncoupled burning or where does that energy go? Um, uh, so, yeah, what is for, remember all things in regulation, we try to regulate stuff so well. And what AMPK, its role in the body is an ATP sensor. And so if you have an abundance of ATP, that inhibits the activation of AMPK. If you have a bunch of AMP that turns on the activation of AMPK via an upstream kinase, but that ki the upstream kinase can't activate AMPK until AMP binds to it. And, uh, and so once, once you have this, accumulation of AMP and ADP too, ADP can keep it activated. Um, ADP has a role in, in the activity of, of promoting AMPK, but AMP is AMP activated protein kinase, right? It's kind of regarded as the major promoter. Now, normally in the body, when you're not taking drugs and, and stuff, it, it's, it's really dialed in for, is your ATP a little bit low? Well, then your AMP is going to be super high if your ATP is a little bit low. And so the body's like, okay, why don't we reconstitute a bunch of ATP? And how do we reconstitute ATP? Well, shut off all the stuff that's consuming ATP. What's the most expensive thing in your house? You know, well, it's protein synthesis. That's it. That's the most expensive thing you got. That's your rent, right? That's the most expensive thing you have is protein synthesis. So, all right, shut that off. Like, let's get let's get our bills down. But at the same time, what it's going to do is promote pathways that reconstitute ATP. And one of those things that's going to reconstitute ATP is metabolically inefficient um, glycolysis. Right? This is not a good way of reconstituting ATP, but but I pull all the sugar into the cell and just burn it and make a bunch of ATP. Now, if you're taking metformin, you have you have messed with regulation in the body. You're you're now inhibiting an enzyme that would be managing levels of your of your AMP, and it doesn't manage them well anymore. Um, and so your, your body gets a little bit excessive um, in its AMP and it gets sort of uh, what I would assume excessive in its ADP reconstitution. I haven't seen, you know, global levels of ATP and, and an athlete taking metformin. I haven't seen anything like that, but in the literature, but I, I would be unsurprised if if we're looking at sort of cellular ATP storage and somebody taking metformin compared to somebody not on metformin. And uh, for something like um, if you're an endurance athlete, there are drugs, the, the, the um, AMP mimetics, the, the, the thing, stuff that's going to activate AMPK. I mean, it's like band, like ICAR, A-I-C-A-R, like that's, that's banned. And that's like a powerful resveratrol, you know, or, or like it's kind of in the ballpark of, of metformin. Metformin is a lot of stuff, though. Um, but, but it's wonderful um, performance enhancers for aerobic athletes uh, if you're going to activate AMPK. Because one of the things that AMPK is doing, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. Let's give you a bunch of mitochondria. So there's a chronic effect of AMPK of, of let's increase your mitochondrial content. And there's an acute effect of it, which is let's, you know, amass some ATP and shut down everything that's consuming your ATP, most notably protein synthesis, and, and let's degrade muscle tissue, let's turn on atrophy, autophagy, yeah, atrophy. So stuff gets so uncoupled uh, um, when you introduce drugs. Um, the body isn't expecting that. And, and normally tightly, tightly regulated processes just have no idea what to do uh, when, when that sort of uh, natural conditions vanish. It just does, you know, oh, these are the inputs. I'll behave accordingly. Um, but those inputs are, are sort of fabricated with drugs. So yeah, if you are something like an endurance runner where you're not overly focused about protein or, or uh, muscle content, 
if there's some value then in yeah, taking something value. like that. Yeah. Anything that's going to activate your AMPK, you're going to be an elite athlete. I mean, elite. You're going to be better. You're, it's going to improve your capacity to do endurance sports if you if you uh, increase your AMPK content, which which is again why I, AICAR ICAR is banned. Um, it's is just, that the it, same I, um, bit of bro science? But is that the same idea between like cardio kills gains kind of thing? Like b- between what? Of like cardio killing gains. Because you're like creating lots of AMP by doing cardio. Mm. And yes, and actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and then, that's yeah. exactly it. Um, and 248, we'll talk all about that. Uh, where if you do a bunch of cardio, good luck getting those biceps huge. Doesn't work. Now, yeah. if you're a beginner, it's okay. If, if you're a beginner and you don't have much experience in aerobics or anaerobics, you know, you both are going to improve. But once people reach a level of proficiency, not just not like, you know, mastery or you know, expertise or whatever, but just proficiency. Now you got to start tinkering, uh, tinkering with some with some variables uh, to continue improving at an encouraging rate. And AMPK is one of the variables you really want to mess with. And if you're doing a much of aerobic activity while you're trying to, you know, get your gains with a Z, uh, you're going to be discouraged. I mean, unless you have, you know, testosterone on board, if you're like injecting a bunch of testosterone at the same time, go, go do whatever. But for, for people who are, who are just eating food and taking supplements, you can get it safe way and whatever. Uh, you got to get a little bit more sophisticated with the programmatic variables and AMPK is the thing to really focus on for, uh, growth of inhibiting, uh, AMPK activity. How long does mTOR get suppressed by alcohol? I don't know. I've only seen up to 12 hours. Uh, so that one study that I had showed up to 12 hours. My hunch is it's not that much longer. Uh, now, the chronic, chronic stuff, again, I, I don't quite accept ACC, apt, uh, except the mouse study that says like, oh, chronic use, you're going to ramp up mTOR. Like you get, get like drunk all the time and you're going to be just a machine. Ah, that's, that's a conditional mouse thing. The reason I showed that was to say, this is not a settled argument. I'm showing you a state of evidence. I'm not showing you the closed book of evidence. And that there may be some chronic differences that don't show up acutely. That's really what I was saying is maybe there's more to the story. And that's really all I had to say about that. Uh, but the bulk of the literature, and there's there's a fair amount that says ethanol suppresses mTOR. And how long? Well, we saw up to 12 hours phosphorylation sites. Uh, and you're not going to be growing without those things being phosphorylated because that means they're not on. If they're not phosphorylated, they're not on. And you have to have those on to be growing, to be translating protein. So um, hard, hard to say, but at least at least 12 hours. So if, um, so we're saying that al- so alcohol impairs mTOR, but can induce or resveratrol can induce AMPK. Sorry, I was reading the comment box while listening and multitasking uh, is not my. Not bad. Okay, so so uh, I was just I was sort of smiling at the comment box. So, wait, I'm sorry. Say, say it again. I'll I'll pay 100. percent You're good. Um, I was just clar- so just to clarify. So alcohol impairs mTOR, but resveratrol can induce AMPK. Yes. So alcohol, ethanol, alcohol is going to impair mTOR. And nobody knows all of the mechanisms and stuff. But what it seems like, what it seems like ethanol is doing is that relationship with raptor, regulatory associated protein of TOR or whatever, raptor. Now, raptor is a critical protein in the mTOR complex. And ethanol seems to work through through uh, preventing a raptor's recruitment of his downstream targets of that interaction between mTOR and raptor. And then potentially ethanol is, is obstructing more specifically the 4-EBP1, but in, how would you, you know, phosphorylate 4-EBP1 anyway if raptor wasn't doing his job? Uh, so there seems to be a couple of identified mechanisms by which ethanol by itself, just ethanol is is inhibiting mTOR. Now, uh, 
when, when you look at resveratrol, the grape thing, right, the wine and grape thing, that's not alcohol, right? That has its own effects. And so what that mm -hmm. is doing, as you said, is it's, it's promoting LKB1's activation of AMPK. Uh, so then, so the, then uh, AMPK yeah. is inhibiting mTOR through both tuberin and raptor. And uh, on the other side, it's promoting uh, protein degradation. Oak one and Foxo. Okay, and then I don't know if I if I missed it, but so then saying so we so we're saying resveratrol can induce whatever LKB LKB ones and AMPK. So then what about so an, an ethanol on AMPK? Does that uh, is there is there an inhibition of it too? Like how it is on mTOR, or there's not, or we or we didn't. I don't know. I. Um... Because I mean, if you're drinking wine, right, you're getting resveratrol and ethanol, yes or no? Yeah, yeah both. Yeah, you'd be getting both resveratrol yeah. and ethanol. The, the yeah. amount yeah. of resveratrol you get in wine, as much as people like to say you get this really kind of healthful dose, you sort of have to take it as a supplement. Um, you don't get so much in a, in a glass of wine that, that you're going to get the effects of it. I mean, there was a study that came out that said, um, you know, a low dose of resveratrol associates with, you know, X, Y, and Z. And then you calculate what the low dose was. And that was a hundred bottles. What the hell do you mean a low dose? Now that was one particular <laughs> study, but what they said, a low dose and, and it was a hundred bottles of wine. Like, and it just said like, yo, know, the, the, there's something about prolonging life and sort of the, the, you know, increasing life expectancy. Like if you drink a hundred bottles in a day, you're dead that day. You know? <laughs> so I, I don't know that that's going to prolong life, but, um, but all it evaluating the mechanisms of these things, there is resveratrol in wine. There's a fair amount of it, and um, and there is a fair amount of ethanol in wine, especially if you're going with like a Robert Parker wine where they've capitalized it, right? Put all that extra sugar, and then and so there's like 15.8 percent alcohol or whatever, like crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're, we should have a couple of means of, of potent mTOR inhibition that should last at least a dozen hours. Hmm. All right, I got to get to Lexi's uh, thesis defense. It's a four o'clock and this, this thing's going to take like 10 minutes to export. So yeah. Um, let's pick up on Monday. I'll, I'll echo the, the mTOR stuff at the beginning of the lecture. Um, and so the, the major points from metabolism of what ethanol and, and what resveratrol, where they're uh, tinkering with, with metabolism, with protein muscle metabolism. And then we'll talk about like hangovers and stuff. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll see you guys.